I was thinking that I might take a little trip. You just gonna get on a bus and don't know where you're going? There's got to be something out there for me. I like a ticket to butt. I believe it's pronounced butte. Oh. <laughs> it's pronounced court killers! <laughs> Welcome to Cord Killers, the show about watching the stuff you love, when you want, where you want, however you want, even if you want to go to butt. I'm Tom Merritt. Hey, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, stepping up to the butt right now, uh, oh wait, no, I guess plate is what you step up to. Uh, Bryce Castillo, what, what did we just see the opening of? <laughs> that was a trailer for Netflix's new film Juanita, about an underappreciated mother who goes on a road trip to find a more interesting life. It stars Alfred Woodard, and it's streaming March 8th. Netflix making original movies. What what'll happen next? I'll tell you what'll happen next is we're going to be joined by the outstanding author and my co-host on the Weird Things podcast, Mr. Andrew Main. Hello, hello. Uh, hey, uh, hey, man. Let's let's get the important news right out of the the, the gate. Your brand new book, M Murder Theory, just dropped, and uh, the Naturalist. Uh, it's the third book in the Naturalist series, and the Naturalist is just taken over. I'm actually I've got two hours left. Loving it. All of the Naturalist stuff. It's my favorite series that you do, man. If people want to buy this, obviously they could just go anywhere, search Andrew Main, find the Natural series, buy the books. Is there a preferred method, an easy way to find them? Amazon. Amazon. My publisher is owned by Amazon. So it all ends at Amazon. It starts <laughs> and it ends there. So uh, look up Naturalist. I think right now, I think they're doing a promo for that. Uh, I think you can get pick up Naturalist like like just for like a couple bucks. Um, yeah. And so get in, get in the shoot, start the series, right? Yeah, yeah. That's how we get you in there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And also the audio book, I think is like really, they've got a really good price on that too. Not to chill. chill it's also chill, really, but... really well done. I like, I like the yeah. dude who reads for it. Yeah. Will Damron, he does a great job. So he's, he's, you know, it's nice. I've got multiple formats here. Nice. Yeah. Very cool. Well, you know, when Andrew's not writing books, he sometimes watches television shows and movies, which is why he's it's here. True. To talk true. about many things, including our primary target. All right. Disney CEO Bob Iger confirmed that Captain Marvel will be the first Marvel movie to show up on Disney Plus after it leaves the window. Remember, we said, like, all those Disney Marvel movies that are going to Netflix, eventually that's going to stop. They're going to start going to the new Disney Plus service, which launches later this year. And it looks like Captain Marvel will be that line in the sand. Everything after Captain Marvel probably shows up on Disney Plus. Uh, Disney has also ordered 10 episodes of Diary of a Female President. This is from Crazy Ex-Girlfriend writer Ilana Pena. It will be produced by CBS TV Studios for Disney Plus, which a lot of people made a lot of hay about saying, oh, Disney's not making all the stuff themselves. But it's it's not the same as Disney licensing old television shows from TV, CBS. They're just commissioning a production company, in this case, the production company owned by CBS TV, uh, to make a, a TV show for them. I would expect them to continue to do that, but they acknowledge that in their earnings call. Iger also said Disney intends to take Hulu international once it becomes the majority owner, which won't happen until their acquisition of Fox is complete, which is expected to happen sometime in the next few months, Iger did say that FX will output its content to Hulu. It will not be taking FX content once it acquires it and putting it on Disney+. Plus. Uh, and uh, if all of that stuff sounds like earnings baloney to you, we could also talk about Captain Marvel's official website looking like it's from GeoCities. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that, that is cute. I wonder if it's cuter to somebody who didn't grow up when that was the, uh, the way websites were made. Like, I wonder I if mean, it seems more novel. It gave me a little bit of a, of a nostalgia kick, right? You know, I played the game, Can You Spot the Kroll? Uh, but... I, I don't think I'll ever go back there. And I think the only reason I went is because we're <laughs> mentioning it on the show. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but but I'll tell you what, man, it's one thing to intellectually know uh, a, a thing we're reporting. Uh, Disney's doing their own competitor to Netflix and so on and so on. Um, but like that felt like a visceral sucker punch. Just realizing exclusively on Disney Plus. Like, like this is the moment that all of a sudden I felt like, oh my God, this is going to be a force with a capital F because uh, uh, they, they own the force because they bought uh, Star Wars. Because <laughs> literally, The Force Awakens, for instance, will eventually be only available on Disney Plus. One would exactly. I, I, so how, how big a deal does this feel like to you, Andrew? Uh, as a person who has uh, 
certain TV rights belonging to one of those companies and watching, you know, how that's going to shake out with, you know, who's producing what and how that works there. It's interesting. It's exciting. I, I, the more we get away from, we pay for TV by making you watch commercials you don't want to watch to letting the consumer dictate the content by saying, okay, I'll pay for the content. I want this. I think it's great. You know, you, you Netflix subscriptions like 14 bucks, 15 bucks, maybe it goes up. It's a great deal. Disney says they're going to be cheaper than that. I'm like, yeah, yeah. Like, and you I don't even have rather... like the, the babysitter factor where it's like, if you have, if you are the parents of kids, then it's just like, whatever they'll, they'll shut up and watch. Great. Uh, I, I'm in. I think the thing to watch out for here will be the change in Hulu and what it will mean to us. Right now, I rely on Hulu as sort of my informal DVR. Even though mm -hmm. I've got a DVR through PlayStation View, the fact that I pay for a commercial-free version of Hulu means that if I'm not watching it the same day it aired, I'm watching it through Hulu because all the major broadcasters in the U.S. are there. Once this is done, obviously ABC stuff will remain there, Fox stuff will remain there, but NBC may pull their stuff out. CBS has never been there. So I, I I wonder if Hulu becomes less appealing or just differently appealing as it becomes the ABC Fox place for shows plus originals like Handmaid's Tale, et cetera. Yeah, yeah it's, if, uh, it's my only, I don't have cable. I have Hulu and I have a couple different packages, you know. Oh. But I'll tell you what, man, if, if I'm if I'm working at Hulu, uh, all of a sudden it becomes desperately important to make sure that you maximize the number of networks that are still on there, that that, 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 that you continue to be the place where as long as it's not CBS, if you missed it, you, you can count on it. Well, that's NBC, right? And if NBC says, mm, thank you, next, I'm moving on to my own service. Goodbye. Which I mean, they but are does, making their own service. Does Hulu have enough strength in its originals to to stand alone? Like, let's say, let's say worst case scenario, both NBC and uh, ABC or, wh or whatever, like, like it stopped being all the broadcast networks and instead... Like uh, they, they just had to license content uh, the same way Netflix did. Like, are they, are I, they I, both? I think I've been enjoying the Who standalones, Runaways, Castle Rock, uh, Future Man. Like, I found those delightful. Uh, so, I do think that Hulu's trump card will be FX. If they if they come out and say like yeah you don't got to pay nothing extra and get all the FX shows on top of the ABC shows on top of the Fox broadcast network shows and the originals like future man, et cetera, castle rock. Uh, and they will, and we're going to talk about some of the originals that they've got coming out soon. Uh, I think that still is a, a competitive offering. I'm also FX curious is, what they do internationally. Yeah. FX is a great lineup and that's the only way I've been able to watch some of that stuff is when it eventually it works its way to Hulu, but waiting, you know, year, two years for like Legion and Fargo and stuff. It's just, it's inhuman. Yeah. Uh, if, 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 Fargo shows up next night on Hulu. That that's a game changer a little bit. Done. I think. Uh, in the chat room, uh, Goucha masks or maybe Disney Plus as a Hulu add-on, uh, which isn't the craziest thing I could think of. I wonder if there's a, the same way that Amazon's able to uh, offer all those subscription add-ons. If if would would you engage in doing that on Hulu or would you? Do it. I don't like doing that. You, I know you like doing the add-on thing on Prime Video. I don't really like doing the add-on thing uh, because I feel like I'm getting a different experience. Like the Prime experience always feels like it's in the actual app. Mm -hmm. But I could definitely see them throwing Disney Plus as an add. I mean, why wouldn't they throw Disney Plus as an add-on alongside Showtime and HBO through Hulu? You can either add it to Hulu Live or or just regular Hulu. Either one, it doesn't matter. Uh, that that seems like it would be a no-brainer. I agree with Gauchem on that. Well, and especially yeah. let's say let's say you're an entry level kind of Hulu person. So it's like you're accustomed to watching ads or whatever. Then all of a sudden there's a button where it's like, hey, for nine ninety nine a month, you get to supercharge, unbelievably supercharge your Hulu experience. Uh, you, you you press this button and all of a sudden you get all these these movies and everything just in that ecosystem. But you have to want Hulu in the first place, right? Because it's it, they're definitely going to be doing Disney Plus standalone. Yeah, correct, correct. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I guess I'm just thinking in terms of uh, it being a portal to get more people in, but I don't know who you're grabbing that wouldn't already be uh, all the way in on it. Yeah, I, it, it's a good upsell for Disney Plus. For Disney Plus, and I don't think it, I don't think it hurts them any to do it. Right? It'll only add to the numbers. But yeah, I, mean, I think hey, there'll be a lot of people who want Disney Plus and not Hulu. Is the thing. Uh, you know what else doesn't hurt very much at all? 
giving us one dollar per episode over at patreon.com slash cord killers keeping us loud live and independent ever since uh what five years ago five years ago magic happened and you guys continue to keep the lights on uh as we record right now we're only 38 dollars shy of our budgetary goal so if you've been sitting on the fence and you've been thinking about giving us a raise becoming our boss you could give us an infinite raise by going from zero to one dollar an episode at patreon.com slash cord killers Right now, we could be breaking to say this episode of Cord Killers is brought to you by you, Space. Uh, but we're not. <laughs> we're saying it's brought to you by just you. Just you. Just you. Yeah. So give us a... We're billing you right now for that. <laughs> <laughs> Patreon.com. Five, five, five years. Thanks We've let it slide. <laughs> we truly appreciate it. Let's talk about how to watch. So remember, we told you that uh, Viacom bought Pluto TV. Pluto TV is a, an app that that shows you a, a more of a live TV experience grid of otherwise available online uh, television shows. They they've actually had Hulu integrated there in the past. Viacom says it's going to continue to offer Pluto TV as a free ad supported service. So what you get right now on Pluto TV shouldn't change significantly any more than it normally would in the course of adding and removing channels. Its decision to remove content from streaming services over the last two years, and by it I mean Viacom, has hurt Viacom's profitability, according to Viacom. They're like, yeah, we left some money on the table, but they say it now gives them the flexibility to more easily bring content to Pluto TV. So Viacom is going to offer its own services as add-ons. That includes Noggin, Comedy Central Now, Nick Hits, some other things that they may be bringing to the table, like they're doing with MTV internationally. Viacom CEO Bob Bakish confirmed that Nickelodeon Studios is also partnering with Netflix on a two-movie deal for new animated movies, one Loud House and the other Rise of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. The idea is to drive people from Netflix who see these movies to Nickelodeon to watch the television series that these movies will be based on. So Viacom seemed kind of crazy when they pulled all their channels from PlayStation View uh, a couple of years ago, but it looks like what they were doing is saying, we want to control the distribution of our stuff, and we didn't want to get stuck with things sort of half being on a bunch of other services. We want to funnel them all into a platform, and that platform is now Pluto TV. So uh, I, I continue to, to think this is a smart play on Viacom's behalf, especially as uh, uh, Pluto continues to grow and, and reach more people. And it gives, uh, as we've seen with Hulu, you can have a model where you start off ad supported and then, and then you're able to add, uh, hey, uh, you want to tell ads to get bent? You want uh, more originals and special con uh, content and so on? Great. Uh, we've also seen that work with uh, Spotify. So this seems like a, a fine playbook. The, the most interesting of everything you said was the idea of essentially bothering to make a movie as an advertisement to remind you that Teenage Mutant Nin Ninja Turtles are a thing and that you could see them over uh, yeah, wherever it is you find them. It's kind of the reverse of we do the series until it's canceled, then make a movie, right? It's like, why don't we make the movie now and get people interested in coming to see our show while it's right, still on the, air? Right, we don't have to cancel it. Uh, it and uh, it reminds me of, you know, I don't know, it, it weirdly, just as in the 1980s, uh, cartoons were a vehicle to sell toys. Now movies are a vehicle to sell your TV show and give people We, we know that's, that's really an old model, actually, like Remember the original Batman uh, TV show? They did the Batman movie, they took episodes together. Star Trek: The Next Generation. They released it theatrically. The 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 pilot. Um, you know, that's a, a technique. Battlestar Galactica is another one. Yeah. I'd yeah. It rarely. That. In fact, the idea we you go off the air, then you do a movie that rarely ever works. You know, but the the reverse being that you know while you're on here in some other markets, you go, hey, this is a thing. I guess The Simpsons, not that The Simpsons needed to drive people, or I guess maybe it did as, as it got older, but The Simpsons did a movie while it was still on the air South and Park. it's still on the air. Yeah, yeah South, South Park, Park too, did as right. well, yeah. Well, yeah. and all the, it seems like most DreamWorks movies, like those kids' movies, are turning into series. Right, either uh, on How to TV. Train Your Dragons. Yeah. And, and uh, 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 what was it? Uh, well, no, right, that's another model, like like the 9 to 5 MASH model. You make the movie and then turn it into the television series afterwards. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I... I do think that this 
I think a lot of times people jump to the conclusion like all these companies hate each other and won't work with each other. And that's that's definitely not true. They will work with each other if they see the advantage. Netflix sees the advantage in being able to have a couple of kids appealing movies that fit their algorithm. Viacom's like, yeah, great. Uh, we need to drive people to this property. And uh, Netflix has the eyeballs we want to drive. So they will partner with each other. I mean, that is the one thing to understand about the television movie industry is the production arms and the programming arms are often very separate with different goals. Yeah. yeah, over yeah, for sure. Over time, we're going to see though. I think that Netflix has been doing a lot more content acquisition, like with Millar World and other things. That it'll be curious to see if these kinds of deals are going to be made three or four years from now, where they're looking at like, do we want to promote something that's going to drive a brand elsewhere? I, yeah, yeah. Will they get to a point where that is no longer productive for them? That's I, wait, let me interrupt Brian one more time. <laughs> I would, I would like to believe that there is such a thing as a true win-win deal. And this does smell as close to one as, as I'm likely to see in Hollywood. I mean, the idea that, you know, Netflix gets the benefit of having an exclusive movie from a universally beloved hot property. And, you know, that property gets to be reinvigorated by people in the one clubhouse coming to the other. I mean, I think um, I'm fond of pointing out that when it comes to building a channel on YouTube, the closest thing to real magic you're likely to experience is the power of a cross promotional collaboration with another channel. And, and this kind of feels like it, like both parties come out with reinvigorated. I'd also add too that I, I was someone who thought Viacom pulling their channels off of the streaming services was a dumb move. Uh, and they were leaving money on the table and Viacom's like, you're not wrong. It was definitely leaving money on the table, but I get now what their strategy was. And it was much more forward thinking than I would have given them credit for. It was, we know that, but we want to control distribution. We think where this is going is that the companies like CBS, NBC, and ABC are all going to control their own distribution, and we want to be in a better position for that. We don't want to have our rights scattered all over the place to where we can't launch uh, something like add-ons for Pluto TV. Uh, so this this could end up being a much better strategy than I than I thought it was at first. Yeah, and I what's funny is <laughs> this is a smart move for Viacom. I think everything they're doing is is a good play. I just have this weird residual Viacom ooginess, uh, where it's like Viacom refused to participate in Hulu back when it launched, saying like, oh, you're just trying to do the same thing that YouTube did to us. And of course, they were the, the first massive lawsuit uh, that, that, that YouTube uh, had to deal with. Um, I, I don't know why I just have bad juju when it comes to Viacom, and, and I, I should be wishing them all the success in the world as they continue to do what we want, which is make their content available in as many different ways as possible. Yeah, there is something about the Viacom name, especially going back to when they owned CBS before the split, right? Oh, yeah. Uh, the, the 90s Viacom was just vilified, like right up there with Comcast. Um, and they, they're all different people now, Brian. <laughs> Yeah, well, Comcast I, I know. learned their lesson. Whoever heard of them again? You <laughs> yeah. Know? yeah, right. They just wait a minute. Xfinity is Comcast. <laughs> Hold on. I Remember hate Time Warner. I love Spectrum. Close they came to buy in Disney. Uh, oh, say again. Comcast tried to do a leverage. Oh, buy that's out right. Disney way back. You know. Yeah, which, a long time ago. Yeah. There's a scary future. For sure. Not like you. It's all about location. Uh, hey, the Umbrella Academy trailer uh, is out uh, showing the uh, Netflix take on the Dark Horse comic series by Gerard Way and Gabriel Ba. The premise is that 30 years ago, 43 children were born one day to women who started the day not being pregnant. Some were bought by a millionaire from their mothers, given numbers as names and trained to become superheroes, a very X-Men, like a dark X-Men kind of thing. Most of them flee as teenagers, but then reunite when they hear that the billionaire who bought them has died, and now they have to save the world. The 10-episode season of Umbrella Academy premieres on Netflix, according to this new trailer, on February 15th. So, uh, so uh, sorry, uh, did, did I hear you correctly? Like, uh, a bunch of women uh, woke up with flat bellies, and then they sneezed or something, and then they were pregnant and had a baby? Uh, yeah. Okay. Right on. I, I don't know about the sneeze part, but they, they definitely were not pregnant. And then suddenly one day they were and gave a baby birth that day. Like, all I can picture is like uh, some American werewolf in London level effects of like, you know, <laughs> latex uh, uh, ballooning out bellies or something. <laughs> it's in the trailer. You, you see I, one of the women just suddenly like float to the top of a pool and she's pregnant. Ah, uh, yeah. All right. Cool. Uh, also, that's, the, that's just the origin pool. story of this. That's not even the majority of the series. Right. Sure, 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 sure. And and so the uh, 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 cool. No, I'll, I'll give it a try. It's it's 
how cool is it that we live in an age where like you get runaways over on on hulu you get umbrella academy we're getting the boys coming out i mean there's so much in you know when it was three-ish four-ish networks and three or four studios you know they would all decide at lunchtime yeah superheroes are dead (laughs) You know, and who wants to buy one of those? And so you would get like eight years without a superhero movie or whatever. And now it's like a lot more avenues, a lot more content. Yeah. Yeah. A trailer for the live action Disney movie Aladdin, uh, which is coming May 24th, came out during the Grammys last night. It seemed fairly fine until the end when it revealed the take on Will Smith as the genie and the Internet erupted in fear how did how would you describe uh his take on the genie my reaction my honest reaction when i first watched this teaser and did not know this was coming i had not heard at the time when i watched this it was brand new it was on television during the grammy ah! and yeah that was pretty much my reaction right there <laughs> I was like, ah, whoa. I'm, I'm glad to see the people who did the scorpion king special effects found work again <laughs> <laughs> It's like it's like a close talker genie, right? It's like a little too big, a little too smiley, a little too much like Will Smith shoved in a blue sock. Uh, it's I don't know. There's there, everything about it is wrong to me. Yeah, I got to admit, I I was surprised that there. Now I understand. Um, I I wonder how much of Disney going back and mining their own back catalog and making live action versions or. Uh, I don't even know if you could call like the Lion King a live action version since it's just they are kind they're billing it as that. But yeah, yeah there's so much CG. Right, right. right. It's clearly animation. Um, I wonder how much of this is a hedge to preserve copyrights or, you know, in, in a shifting landscape of of, of uh, you know, <laughs> I don't think you need to. When copyright is 90 years plus the life of the author. Ford because of Disney. Sure, sure. Uh, but, but, but $200 million, is... dollars, you can just, you know. Yeah, I don't think do it's another cartoon. That. I think it's just uh, like, hey, those old movies look old. Uh, instead of doing animated versions, let's liven it up with a live version. That'll get people in the theaters, even if they've seen the original. You have such built in. It's a safer bet in theory because it's the name recognition. It's a lie. So you have parents who saw it and their kid. Now they have kids and now we'll take the kids to go see. If you look at the timing for when they're doing this, it's when that generation's now has children of movie going age. It's the dream of the child who saw Beauty and the Beast as an animated, seeing it come alive and be real people, right? Same thing for Aladdin, Mm -hmm. Lion King, et cetera. I feel feel like that's what they're trying to sell too. They sell nostalgia. Yeah, uh, that is kind of their main product. At least at Disney, the Disney part of the Disney company. Hulu announced The Handmaid's Tale will return June 5th and released a trailer for the six-episode Catch-22 miniseries uh, starring George Clooney and Kyle Chandler. That arrives on May 17th. Uh, awesome. Uh, d- did you watch... Uh, are you watching the second season of Handmaid's Tale? Well, I, it, the, I watched it when it was... Out. You did. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. did. Okay. Mm-hmm. Cause, cause uh, Bryce was saying on weird things today that he was uh, just getting started on it. I uh, just oh, okay. finished it over the lunch break and that's the finale really pissed me off. Me oh and, really? Me and Justin were texting each other really furiously today because uh, we both have issues with that. I mean, I've been now. on the fence and, and I feel like I should stay over here on the fence. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a hard series to watch, uh, you know, just because it's, it's heavy, uh, and I'm not going to disagree with Bryce about the way it ended because it really felt like they decided at the last minute not to wind up the series. <laughs> that's kind of what, that's kind of the, the yeah, they sort of unwrote a lot of stuff and made a lot of stuff feel not really worth all the time. But, but if, if you're not too pissed off to watch the third season, it's coming back June 5th. I'm watch. more excited for catch 22. Uh, I, you know, George Clooney being a name, obviously that's going to get a lot of people, but it just, the trailer looks interesting. It looks good. It looks well done. Cool. Yeah. All right. Fine. I'm the only one. <laughs> well, uh, Marvel I, I, and I Hulu never read will it. Partner on four animated series, Modoc, hit monkey, Tigra and Dazzler and Howard the duck. These four <laughs> series will cross over in a special called the offenders. 
Uh, Kevin Smith and Aqua Teen Hunger Forces uh, and Squidbillies co-creator Dave Willis will write and produce Howard the Duck. Modoc will be written and executive produced by Jordan Blum and Patton Oswalt. What up? Uh, and they're they're all coming to Hulu. I mean, probably 2020. These things take forever, but they announced it today. Man. This is uh, like uh, okay. Everything about this four individual characters that all team up uh, to to a name that is clearly a uh, a mirror image of the Defenders on oh, on yeah. Netflix. No, uh, and uh, uh, I got to tell you, I was just like, wow, really scraping the bottom of the barrel on this one until I read the words Kevin Smith and uh, Aqua Teen Hunger Force creator uh, Dave Willis. <laughs> like, all of a sudden, I'm so very in on all of these. Yeah. What's next? I mean, what's left? I mean, <laughs> Guardians of the Galaxy movie? I mean, come on. <laughs> you know, really, well, Marvel. It, <laughs> I, I, I think what, what this shows is, is Disney says, look, we want to control the Marvel stuff. We're going to control Hulu. We're fairly certain. Uh, so we will put our adult-leaning uh, Marvel stuff on Hulu uh, and, tr and try to keep the family-friendly stuff on Disney+. Plus. That's what this says to me. Mm, good take. Kevin Smith is totally who I'd go for for the the adult stuff, which they're doing. So that's a yeah. great. And I don't, I don't even think it's a rub your face in it. Netflix. I think they would have done this anyway, even if the whole Netflix deal was still going on because the defenders was existed as a comic before Netflix. Came. Well, sure. Yeah. But I wouldn't be surprised at all. Um, so all of the Netflix were uh, uh, the, those four properties. And then the defenders really seem to be trying to adultify the comic world, make it gritty, make it make it harsh mm -hmm. and have real consequences to everything. Um all of these properties look like they're going to do the exact opposite. Uh, uh, Modoc is going to be a ridiculous looking villain who probably I'm picturing basically Archer, uh, but but for a super villain uh, and, and you know, having these these folks with such good comedy chops. And uh, uh, well, all does it say whether or not all these will be animated? They're, it's yeah, all they're all animated. Yeah. All okay. Animated. Yeah. So, so in that in that case, I mean, I I think it is very much a a rejection of like, hey man, we're trying to be the opposite of what they were going for over on that Netflix thing. And, and and I, you know, the fact that uh, they canceled the Netflix shows doesn't give them the rights to make those shows on Disney Plus yet. Uh, so they might still bring the Defenders to Disney Plus or they might push them to Hulu. Right. This might just be too weird for Disney Plus. I don't know. Yeah. Amazon is launching a shopping channel again. Uh, two years ago, they did one called Style Code Live, but that was just about fashion. This is shopping anything, home repair, whatever you want. Uh, it's called Amazon Live, uh, and it's using the page that they have used for their live streams. They've done some some temporary live streams before. They've done some branded stuff. This is multiple shows streaming at once, a lot of them from brands. And obviously, during any of these streams, you can shop around and buy stuff on Amazon. Uh, all of them uh, let you do that. So it, it's QVC for Amazon. Yeah, uh, I feel like uh, I'm guessing that this is all just a sincere like, hey, we're checking this out. Look at this. Uh, you get you get the joy of unboxing. You get relevant products or whatever. I would love to see kind of sub programming in this where it's like there's one hour that is a timed hour and it's it's very clearly a comedy show pulling out like all the all the craziest weird stuff or putting stuff to the to the test uh, uh, to see if you could punch through, you know, a kiddie pool or whatever. I've uh, never watched thought, any Brian, of these shopping Let's channels. go pitch this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea if these shopping channels already do that. Like, I've, do you watch? Q, I've never watched QVC what, what, in, in years, so the, uh, they uh, might be doing that. I'd have no idea. Uh, I, I don't know of anybody who is intentionally doing it as a written comedy show, and uh, uh, that would be fun for me uh, to subvert and and, and just you know uh, showcase the the most outrageous, intentionally weird stuff for the laughs only, and then also hosted by buys. Andrew Mann and Brian Brushwood. <laughs> Done. Done. Do it. I'm just saying. We'll do it. Yeah. Uh, Netflix reportedly paid around $10 million to buy the documentary Knock Down the House at Sundance. Uh, it follows the campaign of four female Democratic candidates for Congress during the 2018 U.S. elections, and it won Festival Favorite at Sundance this year. Right on. It's great news for documentary you know, makers and whatnot to see that kind of payout for something like that. And, you know, and, huge, yeah. you know, and that was the, the documentary got rave reviews. So, and you know, I think that one of the things I think about now is I think it's a great time for documentaries and these sorts of content better now than it's been before. Also, I have to point out, Brian, that one of the candidates they followed's last name was Swearingen. I saw that. That's crazy. <laughs> Swearingen. Uh, and then finally, the young adult series The Grim Legacy is being adapted for TV by writer David Gleason and Deadline 
believes that it will probably end up at Disney Plus. The books follow teens who work at a library that lends magical items from the Grimm collection. Cool. Yeah. yeah. Cool. I cool stuff. Uh, yeah. More, more young adult books being turned into shows. This is one that will show up on Disney+. Plus. This is the kind of thing you'd expect. You'd expect young adult fiction like this to, to end up on mm-hmm. Disney+. Plus. I think. All right, let's talk about what we've had our eyes on, something you've been watching recently that you love. We'll start with you, Mr. Andrew Main. Uh, real fast, do you guys ever talk about Canopy? Mm, the, I don't think app? so. Canopy is one of these services that works with libraries, and so it's free, like free videos and stuff. They have an app for the Apple TV, and so I've gone through there and I find stuff on there. Uh, K A N O P Y, sorry, K A N O P Y, and like I found, I watched uh, my friend Dahmer. You know, the Jeffrey Dahmer, the the comic book made into a movie about a guy that was friends with Jeffrey Dahmer, and they get some really interesting stuff there that 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 comes out on there. That you know, some like it's a release window where some studios will make deals with it to go there and things that just new on iTunes and stuff or whatever, but it's totally free with a lot of different library systems. So, Oh, so you, when you say a library systems, you're talking about like your public library, you yeah, use public your library, library card. with your yeah. card. You can, you can get permission. You can authorize it there. So, uh, just one, I'll push the service canopy K N A O K A N O P Y. Find out if your library is part of it. And two, like my friend Dahmer was a very interesting movie, uh, based on a graphic novel by a guy that grew up with, Jeff went to high school, Jeffrey Dahmer. And just what was he like in high school? We we get this kind of email every so often uh, because there are other services like this through libraries. They're like, hey, folks, you can watch a lot of free streaming content through your library. So even if your library isn't on Canopy, you might check out and see if they have some other service. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah, there, yeah. There, there are. Uh, uh, we were great. talking. I remember it was uh, Andrew that told me that Lynda.com, the, the high quality tutorial mm-hmm. place, uh, is free with with most library cards. Yeah, I'm like, yeah, Linda, there's so much your library card, kids. It really does unlock a world you had no idea about. <laughs> you know, some look. of the, like, I started watching Mandy, the Nicolas Cage movie by uh, Pasmo Comatos, but like it was, uh, I can't mispronounce his name, Panos. But anyhow, um, it was like a low res, so I ended up just buying it, but other stuff in there is good. So anyhow, just, you know, so much. So, so you've been watching a lot of Canopy, it sounds like. Every now, yeah, I'll go in there. I'm like, oh, that's cool. That's cool. It's not on Netflix. Nice. This thing's not on Prime. And so, yeah. What about you, Brian? Uh, I watched that uh, Swiss Army Man. Did you ever see it? No. Uh, it's the one that's got uh, Harry Potter in it, uh, playing a corpse that has uh, useful magical abilities, like farting so fast you can ride him like a jet ski, or using his teeth to chop wood. Or is this just a movie that that that? Has left the theaters, or uh, is it a? Yeah, no, it's on. It's on Netflix right now. It's oh, uh, it's a Netflix movie. Okay. Yeah, but nope, nope. It's it, it went it to had the a theater. wide release a few years ago. Yeah. yeah, right. But it's on Netflix. I see. Uh, yeah, okay. correct. And um, uh, I'm not sure I felt about it. Uh, I like you could tell that they had like eight or nine clever biological functions as usable set pieces. Like you know, they throw acorns in his mouth and then you know. Uh, twist his arm and he shoots him like a gun or whatever. Uh, but, but the voyage of self discovery that the main character has along the way, uh, ended up, I thought fairly hollow by the end of it. Um, uh, but the but, corpse or the other character? Uh, yes. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, and then I also watched the documentary, uh, the devil we know about, um, one of the chemicals used in Teflon that was as far as storytelling and, and documentary style, it does a lot of the things that I feel like are, are, are cheap shots, you know, where it's like clip mm-hmm. art of, or, you know, a shot of uh, suds in a river, a shot of money, a shot of white people ringing the bell at, uh, at the Wall Dow Street. Jones. Yeah. Uh, and then, and then it, when it comes to making their case that, you know, a lot of heart tugging, you know, they, they, they meet people who are born with uh, birth defects and so on. But uh, when it comes time to like, and we got them, uh, I, I felt like it was a little bit weak, weaker on the science than I would have very much liked to, to have. That's the flip side of the documentaries. There's some great documentaries, as Andrew mentioned earlier. But uh, sometimes when I see trailers for documentaries, it's hard to tell. Is this just a really hype trailer for a good documentary? Or is this like a really bad documentary like you're describing that just makes a lot of claims without a lot of evidence? Well, well was- but also, you can have things that are I, like I'm critical of like the one gas land like that showed things and they just I don't believe are true. They, they made claims that we we found out were not what they presented. And, and that could be it, there might be an issue with fracking and stuff. I don't know. But watching that documentary, you're not going to be any better informed about it. 
So yeah, well, I I saw I saw a trailer for a Sam Cooke documentary on Netflix, and at first Eileen and I were getting real excited, and then the claims in the trailer started like getting more and more conspiratorial yeah. about you know, and and I was like, okay, is this really going to tell me some some stuff, or is this like the JFK but Sam Sam Cooke? Document. Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, uh, and, and to 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 be clear, I, I would love to and it's on me to do my research and find out so I can know what to think. But there was definitely one thing that I thought was super unfair. They did is about like halfway through the movie. It's like uh, this document from Evil Corporation says uh, we could replace this this chemical, but we don't know if another chemical is even worse. Better we go with the devil we know. And it's like very clearly shaking a fist at the evil corporation for deciding to go with the devil they know instead of doing something new. Then you get to the end, and it's like, we did it. We blew up the bad guys. They can't use evil chemical anymore. Then they do the same thing. You're like, but now they're working on something else, and it could be even worse. It's like, you can't you can't have it both ways. You you, you can't you can't demonize them for not doing something new. No, you, you got to have somebody coming in saying the solution to this problem should be reasonable solution, right? But they won't do it, right? Otherwise, it's just, yeah. Well, you, also many documentaries, they're advocating something, but they're not going to tell you directly what they're advocating for. You know, there there's a thing they want you to feel or do, but they're not going to tell you this is why. So we're just going to ask some questions, see where it leads us, and then, you know. Yeah. Well, I, I watched the uh, the Netflix movie High Flying Bird uh, was this that? weekend. It was phenomenal. I, I had wow. no expectations going mm. in. Uh, I didn't know until after I watched it that Steven Soderbergh had shot it entirely on the iPhone. Uh, we, you know, with attachments and lenses and, and mics and whatnot. But uh, there was something somewhat digital about it that I noticed but we didn't realize it was just shot on an iPhone until until we were done watching it. And it's a great story. Uh, it's got an excellent cast. Uh, it's it's got um, it's got a, a well told story and and it's an interesting look at the NBA because they actually weave in a few actual interviews with former NBA top rookies about what it's like to be a rookie. And 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 the premise of the movie is uh, there's an NBA lockout and there's an agent whose agency is being threatened with bankruptcy because of the lockout who also has a client who's, you know, in contention to possibly be rookie of the year who won't get his money for his contract until the lockout is over. And so he hatches a plan to figure out how to solve the lockout over the weekend. You know, uh, do you know the, the connection between that and Moneyball? What's what's the connection? I mean, I could Soderberg see Soderbergh was originally going to direct Money but... Moneyball, and uh -huh. he wanted to direct it. And the format he was going to use was this format. And then when he didn't get to direct Moneyball, he still loved the idea of that format. So when he made High Flying Bird, as he took some of his ideas for that he wanted for Moneyball to do that. So, oh no, I didn't realize that. That's yeah. that's pretty cool. Um, but yeah, I, I it's only an hour and a half too. Uh, so it's it's probably worth checking out. It's got uh, Zazie Beats from Atlanta and Deadpool two. Uh, it's got Melvin Gregg from American Vandal. Zachary Quinto uh, makes an appearance in it. There's there's some 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 good stuff. Cool. In there. Check so, that out. Yeah, I thought it was pretty great. All right, Bryce, what should we be on the lookout for? Hey, uh, this weekend I had a really interesting experience. I was finishing up The Handmaid's Tale season two. Uh, and saw on Twitter that there is football. Football is still going on. Um, Wait I guess, a minute. Football what? the Super Bowl happened. The Super Bowl happened, but there's still... It's what we call soccer, Bryce. They have another country. <laughs> oh, football. Football. No, no there's a, apparently there's a new football league, the AAF, the Alliance for American Football. And this is a new American football league. It's it's positioning itself as like a feeder league for uh, the and NFL. audio format, too. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and I thought it was really interesting seeing a new league with like it's it's eight teams that are all brand new teams that are kind of amalgamations from different parts of the country. And uh, it, it, it was interesting to watch. It is it is mostly similar to NFL football. Uh, there are um, a few different rules. Uh, other websites have more information about those. But I know one of them is the Sky Judge. And yes, when there is, I loved the sky <laughs> change when I read that. When when there's a, a a dispute on a on a play, they cut over to the sky judge who is like in a press box, and they've got the sky judge mic'd up, and so you can hear them deliberate on like what them watching over the replay footage and making the call, which is 
it's it's an interesting bit of transparency for is is the uh, is the sky judge Ed Harris sky like judge. a Truman Show? <laughs> <laughs> I appeal to you, oh sky judge. I sky judge in like a blue robe and some sort of <laughs> angular hat or something. Uh, the other interesting thing about it is that there is a slight cord ki- cutting uh, uh, take on the uh, AAF. Uh, over the weekend, on the opening weekend, it was mostly streamed on uh, CBS, but uh, for the re- coming regular season, it will be streaming across the CBS Sportsnet, the NFL Network, there are a couple games on Bleacher Report Live, and one game on TNT. I think that's this week. Um, that's but if you don't have those, uh, their website, aaf.com, is streaming most of those games. The ones that are not on CBS Sportsnet uh, are going to be on that website. Uh, and they have some mobile apps. Um, I, I watched the uh, the game on Sunday uh, via the the website. And it, it, worked, it worked really well, but it was also... Uh, it was not like the commentary feed. It was not like the full production. It was just the sky cam, the little drone camera that they have, which is a really novel experience. It was very much like playing a video game of football, um, but also there were no graphics or commentary. So that part wasn't great. So I don't know how much that huh. is, is what's going to be the weekly thing there. Uh, it does seem like if this is interesting to you, that Fubo TV has both the NFL Network and CBS Sportsnet, which is going to cover almost all of the games. Um, also, if you are a cable subscriber, you can get CBS Sportsnet with your cable authentication. So, yeah, and it's on like PlayStation View, I think, CBS SN. Is that's right. Well. So um, uh, check that out, AAF. Uh, go Hot Shots. AAF, so, amateur we, AF. <laughs> we call it Alliance, because AAF really does not roll off the tongue. Is this, do we just call it like Alliance the football? Al- or what are they, they've been using what? the Alliance to on okay. on social media. And they have a photo where it says, we demand to be taken seriously. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is interesting. It's not a competitive league to the NFL. It's right. a feeder league, right? It's, I think that's important mm-hmm. to understand. Uh, but yeah, they're, they're, they're doing some things that the NFL would never be able to get away with because they're launching uh, from the start. So that, that's it's interesting if you're still ready for some football even after the Super Bowl. And when's XFL coming back? Next it's coming year. Coming back soon. Ne- next yeah. year after the Super Bowl, I think. So yeah, interesting. So about twelve months. AAF will be up against the XFL next year. So get ready. Hey, folks, if you got something we should be on the lookout for, email us cordkillers at gmail dot com. And uh, folks, if uh, you may have known that. I used to do a podcast with Molly Wood. I am doing a podcast with Molly Wood again. It's called It's a Thing at itsathing.me. Every week, Molly and I get together and we talk about things that are buzzy and we talk about them out loud, but they're not limited (laughs) to technology. There are all kinds of things. We talked about Jeeps and intermittent fasting uh, and gardening and food and technology and all kinds of stuff. Uh, It's it's a blast, and if you're a patron, you can listen to us record it live and and join us in our Discord. All the details available at itsathing.me. Heck yeah. Very cool. Thank you. Let's move on to the front lines. Front lines! A study from Carnegie Mellon University, Erasmus University, Rotterdam, and Catolica Lisbon School of Business used a randomized control study of the habits of 50,000 cable customers to determine what effect DVRs had on their viewing habits. Households with premium channels like your HBOs and DVRs ended up watching more television overall, but it did not change how much live TV they watched. They just watched more recorded TV and watched about the same amount of live TV as they did before. DVR was used most often for TV shows and movies, not for sports and news. And when watching live TV, people did not use DVR functions to avoid commercials. So essentially having a DVR just means you watch more TV, but you get exposed to about the same amount of commercials as you did before. If you're the average viewer, according to this study. I'm, I'm kind of surprised because when I was watching live TV and using my DVR, I would always, you know, wait 10 or 15 minutes just for the privilege of being able to skip past the commercials. As Most I caught people up with don't time. do that, according wow. to the study. You're unusual. Uh, so who would have thought? Uh, <laughs> me- meanwhile, the Super Bowl drew an average televised audience of 98.2 million viewers, down 5%. Though CBS says if you count all the platforms, it, uh, all the platforms have brought in 100.7 million viewers. Streaming numbers came in at 7.5 million unique devices up 20% over last year. CBS All Access signups were up 84% on Super Bowl Sunday. So 
Super Bowl was a hit for streaming, not so we, much for regular viewers. When, remember that streaming numbers too, we don't know. We know what they say, but we don't know. You know that's been that's been the, the criticism well, Netflix is getting about it's that. It's either too. seven point five million unique devices or they're lying, right? I mean, CBS is self-reporting seven point five million unique devices. I guess they might not be lying; they might just be wrong. What, I mean, but... yeah, there's a lot more you can go there. I mean, what what counts as a full view? How many interactions? All this? Were there people like you know doing? They actually just dis, 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 uh, they talked about what counts as a view uh, in the study, and I think it was a sustained number of minutes or something like that. Yes, but, and but you also have sometimes people you have a household where they're playing on the the big screen, and then you put on the smaller screen. I'm saying there's a lot of like maybe I don't know. I'm just saying that like we we've been dealing with this now with the whole well you know it's self reported, you know. Yeah, but I I think this is a big enough sample, especially because it's the Super Bowl that uh, you could safely say. Fewer people watched the Super Bowl over cable TV and broadcast, and more people than last year watched it on a streaming device. Probably. Probably true. And I, and I think that's probably what's significant about this to me, rather than the actual, like, accurate numbers or not, is it, it backs the fact that more people are kind of moving towards streaming for stuff. I agree. Totally agree. NBC Sports and golf champ Rory McIlroy have launched Golf Pass that includes – instruction videos for learning to play golf better, archive tournaments for watching other people play golf better than you, and a monthly round of golf where you can actually play golf uh, once a month for $99 a year. Discovery and Tiger Woods also recently launched Golf TV outside the U.S., so apparently this is a this is a model. That is so wild because, like, any one of those you would think maybe would be alone, uh, alone enough to justify the $100 expense per year, yeah, um, a monthly round of golf would be like forty bucks a round, I think. Yeah, 40, um, that's really wild. Uh, what do you What do you think, Andrew? Uh, uh, chance this this makes it? I think it's I think it's a great concept of like, you know, the multi kind of like the I don't know like what do we like the multi level service. You get this plus this. You know, you people watch Golf Channel, watch golf and content because you want to do a thing. I think it's a you know, in media, we saw the thing of like how like TechCrunch and other companies started doing live conferences. That was the way to sort of justify, you know, across, you know, the, the, those platforms make more money doing that. So I'm excited to see what's next. So. Netflix. Yeah, I, this idea of adding a real world thing to your video subscription is fascinating. Well, yeah. I, I think it does make sense, uh, particularly because, you know, if it's instruction, then presumably you can bank on the fact that you actually play golf if you're going to watch golf instruction. Yeah, right. like you could do, I mean, you, you could do a food channel thing where, you know, you get you get a, a Blue Apron box sent to or I don't know. I mean, there's there's a very, very interesting model there. Yeah, if someone were doing some sort of television show around a topic they were an expert at and also operated a store, they could package it together somehow. Crazy, crazy thoughts. Mm. Yeah. Nah, we went too far. <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> Netflix is adding a feature called Smart Downloads to its iOS app. It will delete downloaded shows after you finish watching them. And when you're connected to Wi-Fi, download future ones. The feature arrived on Android last summer and is also available on Windows 10. Uh, this seems smart, uh, especially if um, I wonder if a easy benefit to tack on would be, you know, you get the higher fidelity. Because uh, remember, we talked about how like AT&T by default, uh, when you're on mobile, uh, they'll, they'll, they'll send a, a lower resolution version of it to conserve bandwidth. Man, there's nothing more disappointing though than going overseas, turning on Netflix and seeing all this cool content, favoriting it, coming back home and be like, oh, no longer there. I crossed a border and now it's gone. Yeah, no, I, I know that feel. Uh, and that would be that would be weird to have something automatically download and then you got home and like, oh no, you can't you can't watch that. You crossed the line. <laughs> you're you're across an ocean now. But I I, I think this is great for developing countries, too, where people don't have connectivity everywhere and rely on these downloads just to watch on the go and don't want to have to constantly remember, like, oh, okay, I got to remember to download yep. the next one. So when I'm on the train, that one's there. This this will just kind of automatically do it for them. Netflix's Roma won four BAFTA awards. Uh, BAFTA is the British version of the Oscars. It's their film awards. Roma won Best Picture, Best Director, Best Cinematography, and Best Film Not in the English Language. Netflix had only won a BAFTA once before uh, for Ava DuVernay's documentary 13th. Uh, man, that's big. That makes me feel like there's a lot of momentum going into uh, the Oscars. Uh, yeah. 
if you were going to guess, how many how many Oscars do you think uh, Roma wins, Tom? Three. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and there's no strategy behind that that pick. That's just a <laughs> gut pick. Uh, movie service Epix has launched Epix now for six dollars a month, which gives you access to four live channels and its movies and original shows on demand. It's available for Apple TV, Android, and iOS. With Amazon Fire TV and Roku support, is quote coming soon. It's funny. Yeah. I, I often think of Epix as being ahead of the game because they were available on a lot of the streaming services as an add-on early, like Prime Video and stuff. But they never did their own thing until now. That's kind of weird. Yeah, I, I, uh, man, I, I, I've never really given Epix much of a, a attention, and I, and I should. Yeah, they're the ones that you looked. I remember going back and looking at their library stuff and going, man. And that was prob part of the problem when you were focused more on these channels as movie delivery platforms. You know, which would make sense when you had cable, like, let me see what's around there. But now that you kind of got to define it with your own content, producing your own shows is a great idea. And Epix is turning podcasts into shows. So Do I hear opportunity. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think Cord Killers would make a great Epix television. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's get to the dispatches from the front. We got a couple of emails. Now it's a representative sample of the emails about ultraviolet. They came in on all sides of the issue. Uh, we got one boots on the ground report, and then one that we think summarizes the positions very well. We promise we won't go 17 minutes on ultraviolet. Sure. Uh, uh, but, although I will say that 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 judging from the Twitter response, I thought that I was like, oh, I guess everyone in the world uh, didn't understand my point, and I'm wrong. But then, uh, but then I was really surprised uh, that that it seemed uh, like 50-50 in in the uh, in the email responses. So Ron redeemed an ultraviolet movie in Voodoo. Uh, he redeemed Valerian and the City of a Thousand Planets. St don't judge Ron, okay? <laughs> it doesn't matter what movie it was. Uh, it did not show up in movies anywhere because that movie studio does not participate in movies anywhere. So Ron says, I hear what Tom was saying in his defense, but I have to say that the process was a pain to go through. And now I'm out of digital code for my movie. I expect there's going to be a lot of other consumers who hit up against the same issue with the laundry list of movies on the website. I appreciate the movies anywhere was trying to do the right thing. And it's not their fault that certain studios didn't participate, but as a consumer, you're getting screwed. Uh, this, I, I really like the way uh, Chris put it together here. Um, he says, Ap apologies for comparing you to organs, but Tom is the brain and Brian is the heart. Tom's logical and correct take is that there's no real harm. Ultraviolet was a way to extend access into the digital realm and people still have that, that access through their linked stores, we, even with Ultraviolet going away. Brian's emotional and also correct take is that people making uh, that people making noise about this see the demise of, as, of Ultraviolet as confirmation of their initial fears that the platform wouldn't last and ultraviolet itself is gone in their mind or should i say their heart the uh the idea that movies are technically still available through the connected stores or that movies anywhere has picked up the mantle are not going to assuage the deep-seated suspicions that digital ownership is not to be trusted and that they uh, can eventually be duped who's to say the fandango now won't disappear next year or that in a few years walmart will decide it's not worth it to keep voodoo going or that in five years movies anywhere will go the way of ultraviolet or that some legal snafu won't kill digital rights to a chunk of your library you can't promise these things won't happen so that seed of doubt will always be there as is often the case rational and emotional arguments are not fully reconcilable because you're arguing different things and that was something that we realized only on twitter the day after is that it wasn't that one side was right and one side was wrong it was that both sides had uh, uh not incompatible theses uh that, uh that uh that that neither of us quite uh picked up on from the other it was ravenclaw versus gryffindor uh, sure. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I say. I mean. I. Yeah. I get the divide, and I'm a guy that's like, yeah. I buy. I mean. I buy almost everything on iTunes. But I like movies anywhere because now I can watch a lot of my same stuff there. But I get people like, yeah. If it goes away, I've watched my Google, my original Google movie stuff went away when they got rid of. You know, I've had stuff disappear from other services. And like, yeah. I get. You're right. To me, I like the convenience though of just having it all in one place. And if I had to rebuild my library, it would suck. But I didn't. I never bet on Ultraviolet because I always thought they were doomed. You know, I just had no confidence in them. Out of the yeah. dozens and dozens of emails that we got, there was one metaphor that I thought was pretty good. Uh, somebody said that, um, uh, and it, I think it satisfies both of our points, Tom. Uh, he said that uh, uh, Ultraviolet was was perceived as or pitched as uh, essentially the one key to open all the doors in the building. And then uh, one day they're like, okay, well, 
that key is not going to open everything everywhere, but it does open all the doors that it currently opens right now. And then meanwhile, you're just aware, like, they're still building more floors on this building, and this is never going to work upstairs. It's like, well, why are you complaining? It still works everywhere. It always worked. And then uh, I, I thought that was a, a good way to put the, the frustration and also portray, you know, accurately that you're right. Nothing is being taken away. A uh, few points that I would like to clarify and also acknowledge. Uh, one, there was some confusion about what will happen on July 31st. Some people were objecting. They're like, this is why I'm mad. Uh, and and I had to say, that's not going to happen. Uh, what Ultraviolet has said is everything in every store you have linked will stay there. Some people are like, yeah, I bought it on Fandango Now and I'll still be able to get it there, but it'll be gone from Voodoo. No, if you keep Voodoo and Fandango Now both linked to Ultraviolet, on July 31st, that movie will continue to exist in both stores afterwards. So don't unlink your Ultraviolet accounts or you will lose your movies. Uh, that's something that has been misunderstood, and I think that's worth clarifying. But we're also going by what Ultraviolet has said they will do. Uh, some people <laughs> some people complained. They're like, yeah, but I've done – I've had movies that were linked in Ultraviolet and were there for months disappear, and I had to go to customer support. That's why I'm mad. I'm like, well, that has nothing to do with Ultraviolet shutting down or not. That's just being mad with Ultraviolet or the store that you have your, your movie in. And if July 31st shows up and technical issues do cause copies to disappear, I too will be very mad at Ultraviolet. So I think that's worth pointing out as well. Uh, and, and to be clear, if you don't have an existing account on one of – them you have to go make an account uh in order to link it to your ultraviolet before the deadline uh yeah you should make an account right now if you here's the thing a lot of the people angry about this never used ultraviolet because like oh, i knew it was a, a hoax but they won't have these movies cross-platform if they don't go a link it now before it shuts down so you might want to do that actually uh, Michael Sellers wrote and said, I watch Cord Killers on YouTube, but I listen to After Talk, the, uh, the patron uh, promo uh, or uh, the, the patron gift that we give on my phone. I avoid spoiler in time because, you know, spoilers. I wouldn't see the harm in a blurb that said, hey, if you're watching Cord Killers on YouTube, like and subscribe. Yeah. So this was, if you don't know, for the patrons, we do a patron only after talk uh, anywhere from, you know, 10 to 30 minutes of extra just uh, uh, inside talk or, or, or kibitzing. And uh, we got an email from somebody who only watches all of our contents on YouTube. And, and it, we realized, oh, wow, we really don't show a lot of love to our YouTube friends. Too. So to all of us watching uh, on YouTube, please like and subscribe because uh, you're right. We, we should be trying to appeal to all platforms more. Uh, and finally, Alex Howard uh, wrote us a note of clarification. Uh, we were calling Lowcast nonprofit. Nonprofit means nobody can make money. Uh, that's different from not for profit. Uh, what we were describing last week was a not for profit. So that that's fair. Thank you, Alex. Uh, Lowcast. Uh, which, if you didn't hear last week's show, is a service set up as a not-for-profit uh, that will provide access to your local television channel streaming because they're not-for-profit. Uh, the law allows them to do that. Alex also says, interesting that their page is copyright by Sports Fans Coalition New York Incorporated, which might shine a bit of light behind the agenda of the organization. Uh, the Sports Fans Coalition is best known for petitioning the FCC successfully to end the 40-year-old sports blackout rule. This was the rule that if you didn't sell out a local game, it would be blacked out of local television and nobody would get to see it. They got the FCC to, to stop that. And Sports Fan Coalition also championed the introduction of the Fans Act in the U.S. Senate during the 114th Congress, which would have required professional sports leagues if they wanted to maintain antitrust exemptions to prohibit broadcasters taking down sports events during negotiations with pay TV companies for retransmission rights. Yeah, that's I'm interesting. I'm still confused that there's a differentiation between nonprofit and not for profit. Nonprofit says nobody makes money off this. This is a nonprofit organization. Not for profit says you can make money, but all your money has to go back into the organization and you can pay people to be but your employees. You, one is a legal status, and the other one is what you can use to apply to that, though. They're used interchangeably, though. That's with, and we were using them interchangeably yesterday. But you're, yeah, you're valid to do that, in my opinion. Well, thank you. <laughs> so, I appreciate it. <laughs> Uh, but you can, you know, uh, UUNet, remember UUNet, which was the big internet provider? Yeah, the started of the internet started as a nonprofit, um, was a nonprofit just to make cheaply available internet access. And it turned out a lot of people wanted internet. So it became a multi billion dollar company. 
Yeah, that was yeah. one of the things that we uh, speculated on when we were talking about low cast is the possibility that they could they could not show a profit as they continue to grow to city to city to city. Then all of a sudden they're they're nationwide and the landscape has changed. And then they could shrug and be like, guess who's for profit now that we got the laws changed because uh, everybody yeah, loves you us. Know, another angle on that that I thought of, Brian, which might even be easier than getting the laws changed, uh, although it does sound like this, that's what these folks do, right? <laughs> they lobby and try to get the laws changed. So it plays right into that. But another angle angle would be to have and this is imaginary but let's say they get so many people watching that ratings depend on low cast viewers and they go to the networks and like all right we're not going to be not for profit anymore but you got to give us a bargain on the the retransmission fees so you're actually going to make money off us which you can't right now uh but if you don't do it you're going to lose all these these viewers because the movie them all. pass plan what can go wrong <laughs> no right. but, but but that is kind of the the the, to, the tommy carchetti uh from from uh, the wire plan where it's just like because you remember when he comes in as a councilman he he pushes like what can i do to help and they're like nothing get bent and then he just tears into him at a city council meeting and he's like now would you like my help and so now that now that now that you have my help on a thing now you, you 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 know i have leverage over you yeah and then uh, uh uh what was the uh what was the company that was trying to do the the streaming local tv shows the before? Aereo? yeah then Aereo comes in and sits down and is like let me tell you about my first day for streaming television and they brought me a big bowl <laughs> Exactly. Uh, hey, uh, Andrew, if everybody were to go out and buy Murder Theory right now, how happy would that make you? I mean, everybody, like literally everybody in the world, I would be pretty happy. <laughs> um, if you want, if you're going Murder Theory, what's this? It's the third book in the Theo Cray series. You can read it as a standalone or you can go get Naturalist, the first book, for like two bucks right now. So I would be very happy, though. It would uh, be very happy. I probably wouldn't cry myself to sleep tonight. I've, I've said before, I'll say it again. Uh, the Naturalist is out of all the series that you do, uh, my my favorite. It's it's the one that I just I just love, love, love. Thank you. Go check it out, folks. Entertain yourself. Get some good reading. Make Andrew happy so he won't cry tonight. That's Everybody, right. Wall wins. Street Journal bestselling series needs your help because because it does. It yeah. just does. Yeah. Our website is cordkillers.com. Our email address is cordkillers at gmail.com. We're live on twitch.tv slash night attack, which is also carried on diamondclub.tv Mondays at 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific. We'll talk to you again next week. Hey guys, Brian and Tom here, and it's just the same old message at the end of the credits, just like always. That's right, Brian. Nothing new here except your name showing up. Oh my gosh! Because I've you got a just name. supported us on Patreon. Yeah, all those five dollar donors. Look at that. That's your name in pixels. When we're gonna make you famous, kid. Put your There's name in pixels on the internet. Classic names in there. But some of you are new. Some of you aren't there. It's sad. What can they do, Brian? I mean, they could go to patreon.com slash cord killers and pledge five dollars an episode to be one of these amazing people, like this the one. Amazing. Oh, look at look at that name right there. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>